Right. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm happy here to welcome um, Jim Suits. My name is Adrian Tucker. I'm with Cal's International Programs. Um, if you don't know me. Um, so Jim Suits is visiting us here from USDA. He's a senior advisor for program operations at USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. In his role, he supports USDA's trade capacity building programs by advising on and in enabling best practices of project management for a programming portfolio of roughly $700 million per year, including streamlining procedures and figuring out how best to employ a variety of instruments to fulfill a constantly shifting mandate. He previously worked as a frontline project manager in a variety of initiatives relating to agricultural statistics and monitoring and evaluation of program activities in emerging market countries. He is originally from a small town in Upper Michigan, 98 miles from the nearest Starbucks, and has degrees from the University of Michigan, Colorado State University, and George Mason University. He is certified in project management, contracts management, and grants management. He speaks four languages and has conducted field work in 28 states and 19 foreign countries. So a wide breadth of um, ex experience and expertise, and we'll be able to share with you everything about USDA and how, as he's been saying, we can take USDA's money. <laughs> uh, please, the floor. please take our money. Um, so of course, one bit that is not in my uh, breadth of experience is figuring out these screen configuration here. So if I look like I'm looking off to the wall here, please don't be alarmed. Um, that's what my screens are. So um, good afternoon. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you all for coming uh, in the room and online. Uh, so this afternoon, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the Foreign Agricultural Service. Like I said, as, as Adrian replied, my, my takeaway message to you, I'll say it right up front, is please take our money. Um, you know, if you are either looking to get grants as a faculty member or looking to get jobs as a student, either way, it involves our money going to you. So um, it works out the same either way. Too. I have to figure out which hole out. Figure out these screens again. There we go. All right. So I want to start with a bit of trivia. So back in January, I was in Naples, the place where pizza was invented in southern Italy. And at the next table over, there was a couple of obnoxious American tourists, one of whom was saying that the reason that tomato sauce is found ubiquitously in Italian food is because Julius Caesar thought that it reminded him of the spill of blood of his enemies. <laughs> True or false? Well, I mean, false. I'd say it's false. You do say it's false. I, I say it's false due to the fact that I don't think it's because of that reason, but like because of the vast amount of tomato uh tomato farms across the Italy. And that is the mm -hmm. true reason. Other thoughts? It's pre Columbian exchange. They didn't have tomatoes really Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheater. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yes, that is exactly right. Uh, there were no tomatoes in Italy prior to the Colombian exchange, which was in the 1500s. Um, so Caesar never saw a tomato sauced or otherwise in his life. Um, it is a sort of thing, though, when you think about the man's personality. I mean, he was kind of a, you know, it's the sort of thing he might have done. Too bad he never had the opportunity. Um, so why do I mention this anecdote? So in the world, there is a lot of food. Also in the world, there are a lot of people. In general, those two things are not in the same place. Um, the mission of the Foreign Agricultural Service is to fix that. Um, we link U.S. agriculture to the world to enhance global food security, uh, bringing food from where it is grown, i.e. here, to where people want to eat it, i.e. elsewhere. So as the international arm of USDA, uh, we are the eyes, ears, and voice for American agriculture around the world. Uh, we have our headquarters in Washington, and uh, we have I don't think these, I think these numbers have changed slightly, but let's say approximately 93 international offices covering approximately 171 countries uh, around the world. Uh, we do all kinds of things involving trade promotion, uh, trade policy, trade capacity building, um, data and analysis. Um, an agricultural product can mean many things. Um, I talk about food security often, but agricultural products can be pretty much anything grown on a farm. Um, so it can be basic food, including pet food um, and seafood. 
Um, it can include uh, everyone's favorite uh, tarts beverages, uh, it can include cotton, even flowers, biofuels, animals, uh, genetic material, uh, forest products. These are all agricultural. Um, one of the things that we like to point out is that in many cases, there are products that you don't think about as agricultural products that are actually accidental byproducts um, of agricultural production. So, for example, a lot of waste products uh, that are not soup fruit, that are not desirable for human consumption can go into pet food or can be used for other purposes. And we try to promote those uses as a, as a sustainability measure. Um, you know, better to use them for something than to throw them out. Um, this is a map of approximately, a, um, if I remember correctly, this map is a few years old now, showing the locations of our overseas offices. Um, if you look closely, you'll notice that one of those dots is technically not overseas. Um, that is not a uh, error that there is actually an office in Miami that covers the Caribbean basin. Um, but this is just to illustrate the global footprint um, that we have uh, with FAS. Um, so USDA as a whole, looking beyond just FAS, we have research labs in six countries, we have food safety offices in 29, and we have trade and development offices in 72. Some countries have more than one office, as you can see. Um, at one point, I thought when I was originally putting together the slide deck, gosh, wouldn't it be swell if I could count up all the countries that we have some kind of project or programming or presence in, and I, I gave up. It's, it's a lot. It's most of them. Um, with the exception of North Korea, Iran, um, Crimea, Syria, for some reason we don't have a lot going on there. But um, most of the countries in the world, we have some kind of project or program or presence, something that starts with a key. Um, one of the things that we always like to point out is U.S. agriculture feeds the world. Um, there are certain products that are grown heavily in the United States that are um, in many cases exported around the world, particularly a lot of nuts, as you see on the left-hand side there. Um, you know, over four-fifths of the, of the uh, almonds produced in the United States are uh, exported to other countries. Um, a lot of grains, uh, you know, half of our wheat, half of our rice, um, you know, half our soybeans, half our sorghum um, is all being exported. This is helping to keep the world food secure, um, and this is the contribution of U.S. agriculture to the world. From the standpoint of U.S. agriculture, though, you might think, well, what do we care about the rest of the world? After all, they are technically located in foreign countries. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is pure economics. Um, Four-fifths of the world's purchasing power is outside the United States. Um, so if you're doing the mental math in your head, that's a, a clear majority by a substantial amount. Um, but there's also more uh, substantive reasons for that. Um, it creates resilience, it protects against localized shocks, you know, weather shocks, floods, earthquakes, <laughs> fires, that sort of things, you know, economic disruptions, um, you know, ports that might have uh, issues, you know, strikes, um, you know, those sorts of things. There can be issues with natural resources from a standpoint of environmental sustainability, right? You can put, grow products in places where it makes the most sense to grow them, not trying to force something into an environment that it doesn't fit, um, in order to create a localized uh, product. And um, plain and simply, every billion dollars in agricultural trade supports approximately 7,500 jobs. Uh, last year, the United States had uh, almost $200 billion of exports alone and another $200 billion of imports. Um, that is more math than I care to do in my head, but that creates, that's a, it's a big number. So what does FAS do? Uh, to try and do all of these things. Um, our first uh, arm is what we call trade policy. We try to expand and maintain access for agricultural products around the world. Um, part of this involves uh, removing trade barriers, enforcing uh, rights that we have under existing trade agreements, sometimes creating new trade agreements, uh, trying to uh, overcome some of these barriers that exist. Um, a large part of that uh, particularly in the office that I work in, involves in establishing and working with international standards and rules. So if you're uh, counting on a map, there are approximately uh, 200 countries uh, in the world. Uh, it's going to be a royal pain in the rear if all 200 of them have different standards for everything. Um, so trying to have consistency in those international standards is um, very helpful um, in order to try and make those, um, those the trade markets uh, open as they can be. Uh, one example of a uh, trade policy uh, program we're working on is are these humble stickers. Uh, so these tomatoes that Julius Caesar never saw, 
Um, these are medium tomatoes on the vine. That's code 4664 for those of you who have ever worked in retail. Um, that code, you might only know it for that, that code. Um, but there are 42 different kinds of tomatoes and 14 different kinds of avocados and 250 different kinds of apples and so on. No human is going to be able to remember all of those codes. But even beyond that, there's more to that sticker than just that four digit number. This sticker is used for tracing. It's used for organic integrity. It's used for shipping. It's used for all kinds of information so that if there's some kind of you know, contamination or some kind of disease track, you can trace that product back to where it came from, how it got there, so that you can try and isolate the source and you don't have to take all the tomatoes in the world off of the market. So our colleagues in France uh, have decided that these little stickers are the scourge of our day and that they must be home compostable which means they have to biodegrade within nine months at room temperature. So the question is, how do you make a sticker that's going to be readable, that's going to stick to a product, that's going to decompose at room temperature, but which will not decompose onto the product before the product is purchased? Um, if you have an answer to that question, please let us know. But um, turns out the problem is actually with the glue. The sticker we partly figured out. The glue is we're still working on. Um, so. These stickers are very important. You can't just not have them. But at the same time, you know, they do create these issues, um, which incidentally, in case anyone's wondering, the reason why France thinks these stickers are problematic is because of food waste. So tomatoes go bad. If the sticker is on them, you can't compost the tomatoes. Uh, we also work on trade promotion, trying to improve markets, improve trading ability, improve uh, port operations. Uh, so we do this in partnership with 75 groups. We call them cooperators. Um, these are sort of um, amalgamous uh, sectors of the U.S. agriculture industry. Um, we administer a variety of market development programs uh, trying to promote um, agriculture moving across borders. Again, we want our agriculture going overseas. We want other people's agriculture coming here, uh, ultimately improving food security everywhere. Uh, one of the things that we do, which people find really fun, is we do um, a lot of trade shows. So for example, this is obviously a wine show um, and we'll have you know, some of these American wine companies there you know, competing with the New Zealand and Spain. Um, ours are. Um, so I wanna highlight one of the things that we work very heavily with NC State on is scientific exchanges. You know, we do a lot of collaborative research uh, which, you know, this is the generic stock photo of someone looking quizzically into a beaker that you'll find on the front of every college brochure. Uh, the beaker is, of course, empty because the photo is staged, but the research is not. Um, so, you know, these are folks who are looking and trying to better understand agriculture, to make things grow better, to make them grow more efficiently, to make them grow with less pesticides and with less, less fertilizer. Um, you know, being able to ultimately achieve everyone's goal, you know, producing more food that lasts longer, that tastes better, that requires less environmental damage. Um, we support a lot of research fellowships. These are where we bring uh, foreign uh, nationals to the United States uh, to conduct research for a period of time to better understand, you know, the, the latest and greatest cutting edge laboratory technology. Uh, we do exposure tours, you know, but, you know, just, you know, sort of quick you know, hey, here's how things are done. You know, we know what we're doing. Here you can learn from it. Um, and uh, for faculty, we also encourage the exchange of ideas, including allowing faculty to uh, take sabbaticals within US, with USDA laboratories I mentioned earlier. Uh, we do a lot of work in capacity building, uh, helping developing countries, uh, or as we call them in law, emerging markets, uh, improve their agricultural systems and build their own capacity to participate in the international system. Uh, this can include everything from donations of agricultural commodities to the countries on the very poorest ends of the value chain, uh, provision of technical assistance to countries who are sort of in the middle trying to get themselves organized, uh, improving teaching and pedagogy among university faculty. So we'll sometimes bring university faculty over to learn how to be university faculty, um, you know, how to apply for grants, how to write a curriculum, how to, how to craft a syllabus. Um, addressing, you know, SPS and technical barriers to trade that threaten um, a clear movement of the agricultural value chains, and a lot of analysis of agricultural trade issues, including data and statistics, trying to figure out how much of 
agricultural products are being produced in particular places. Um, and uh, that's not probably important. But, um, you know, and, and, and where it's going. Uh, one example of this is African swine fever. Um, so uh, North Carolina, as many of you know, is one of the largest producers of uh, pork in the United States. And ASF is a big deal. Um, so ASF is a pig disease. It is quite harmless to humans, at least for the time being, and it is very fatal to pigs. If your pig gets ASF, there is something like a 98.5% chance that it will die from it, and a 100% chance that it will spread it to other pigs. Um, there are current outbreaks of ASF in large chunks of the world, including the uh, pretty much the entire Eurasian continent from China and Thailand all the way into Eastern Europe, um, down into Africa, as the name might imply. Um, currently, there is no outbreak of ASF in North America, but there is in the Dominican Republic. Uh, if you're doing the mental geography in your head, you'll know that the Dominican Republic is only uh, less than 100 miles from Puerto Rico, which is, of course, U.S. territory. And um, the expectation is that if ASF is to make landfall in the, the continental United States, the estimated impact to the U.S. pork industry will be something like $50 billion. So um, to put that in perspective, the entire annual U.S. pork industry is $23 billion. Um, personally, I think, if anything, that $50 billion is probably an understatement. Um, because in the U.S. we have large feral swine population, and so essentially once African swine fever makes it to the United States, it will be all but impossible to extricate. Uh, exacerbating that, um, the virus is very resilient. So, you know, with a lot of animal diseases, you say, well, it's very easy. If the disease gets in, you just depopulate, you know, it, except the problem is that virus will last for at least five years in the soil um, where those pigs were living. Why do we say at least five years? Because that's as long as we have data for it. So we're not really sure how long it takes it to go away, um, but it's a while. Um, we do a lot of stuff, as I mentioned, in information and analysis. So trying to say, okay, what is going on with food in the world? Where is it being grown? Where is it being shipped? Where is it being bought? How much does it cost? Um, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, we work with a lot of international groups to produce some of that market information. So for example, the FAO of the United Nations, um, you know, an organization called ECA in the Americas through a uh, subsidiary called MIOA, uh, which if I thought about it, I could figure out what that stood for. Um, you know, providing objective data on foreign market conditions. One of the things that you'll note if you ever are doing research where you are looking at um, reports produced by uh, foreign countries on uh, commodities, you know, crops that they're growing, how they're being shipped, You'll notice that those reports invariably come out five to seven days after the USDA report of the same country on the same commodity. Um, officially, that's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Um, there was quite famously an incident in Argentina a few years ago where we had our, our office in Buenos Aires had a technical problem with their computers. And they said, uh, due to a technical issue, our report for Argentina is going to be delayed by five days this month. Sorry for any inconvenience. The next day, the Argentine government put out a report that said the Argentine government's uh, report on you know, this commodity in Argentina will be delayed by five days this <laughs> month. Sorry for the inconvenience. Um, so USDA is the world leader in, in understanding these things. We also have, uh, if you're doing uh, interested in qualitative research, this system called GAIN. This is public information. Um, you don't even need to log in. You can just go on our website and access it. And these are qualitative reports, uh, which can get into everything from the basics to these incredibly detailed things about whatever an official standard NOM 173 feedback, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, and you can search them. You don't have to like read through them all. They're searchable. Um, we prepare production forecasts, assess opportunities, try and figure out again, where food is, where people want to eat it, and how we are able to connect those two things. We of course also track changes in policies that affect agricultural trade. Um, so, you know, many countries have a tendency to do things like export bans, which have all kinds of problems, both domestically and internationally, uh, or they'll try and ban imports of certain products uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, for example, if you are uh, in the chicken industry, you will know that you cannot sell chickens to Nigeria. Um, officially, that's because the Nigerians are worried about HPAI, which is a poultry disease. Never mind that Nigeria already has HPAI. And gosh, what a shocking coincidence that the largest poultry farm in Nigeria is owned by the former president. 
it's weird how these things work out that way. Um, an example of this is MIOA. Um, this is a cooperative network comprising government institutions um, whose functions are the collection, processing, analysis, depth, and image of information about markets, agricultural commodities. So MIOA operates in the Americas, uh, all of the countries uh, except uh, Cuba and Venezuela, which for some strange reason declined to participate. Um, and the purpose of MIOA is to do these things that you don't think about, but which are really uh, quite vital to a functioning system. So uh, it, is anyone in the room a native speaker of Spanish? Okay, so you'll, you, may under, you may be familiar with um, A couple of years ago, there was an incident in um, Guatemala where they were trying to buy some avocados. And so they were calling around to different warehouses trying to find some avocados. So they called down to a warehouse in Argentina and they said, you know, hey, we're calling, we're looking for some avocados. Can you help us out? And they were like, yeah, sorry, don't, don't know what that is. We don't have any. Right behind the guy who answered the phone were boxes and boxes and boxes of avocados, except they called them faltas in Argentina. It sounds like the dumbest thing, but little things like that can make huge differences when we're trying to uh, feed the world. Um, it's things like that that it's like, okay, well, everybody would have won if they had not had that. Then they weren't even speaking different languages. They're speaking the same language and they're still having a linguistic barrier. Um, so these sorts of issues, you know, sound very minor, but they need to be addressed. They're not going to fix themselves. Um, and this is something that we work very heavily to try to overcome, making sure that we're using consistent terminology, making sure that these things are well understood, uh, where things are, where they need to go. Uh, we do a lot of our work in partnerships. Um, you know, the USDA Foreign Agricultural Services total staff is less than a thousand, um, including however you count it, it ends up being less than a thousand. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of our work through other organizations. Um, these can include international organizations like the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, the World Organization for Animal Health, FAO, World Food Program, and so on. Um, they can include private sector organizations like the American Soybean Association, U.S. Wheat Associates, um, other government agencies, you know, we work with FDA, for example, on the Food Safety Modernization Act and some other um, related points. And we work with universities a great deal um, to, to do a variety of things, including but not limited to short and long-term technical expertise. So, you know, many of the uh, professors who some of you have had classes with, or if you are the professors teaching the class, uh, we'll take those same professors and we'll plunk them into some of these places and they'll teach some of the same subjects uh, in many of these other countries. Um, activity implementation, instructional programming, a lot of the innovative applied research. Um, so many of the labs that exist on campus, um, you know, some of the research that's being done there uh, can be applied in many of these places. Um, and it's, you know, research is very interesting if you do it for the sake of research, um, but it's really much more useful if you're able to do something with it uh, practically. Uh, and of course there's, you know, training the next generation, um, you know, the people who are going to come after those of us currently uh, leave. Uh, so working at FAS, uh, we of course have, you know, internships, uh, positions at all level, um, both US-based and international. Um, there are uh, a variety of things to suit every interest. Uh, if you have an interest in foreign agriculture, not interested in foreign agriculture, FAS is probably not the place for you. Um, we of course employ, you know, economists, attorneys, marketing specialists, veterinarian, blah, 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 all kinds of agricultural professionals who can best represent U.S. agriculture interests um, around the world and who can speak to them competently. Um, as I like to point out um, when I'm meeting with technical experts, my background is political science. I can tell you all about policy. I can give you the, the history of the political development of any country on the world. Um, I know that if you look at uh, soil, there are 37 different kinds of soil. Could not tell you the difference between those 37 different kinds of soil, let alone do I know anything about them, but I know there are 37. I know why it's important. Um, so everyone is, you know, you have to be able to speak generally while having a particular area of expertise. Um, one thing I do want to stress, though, you know, the FAS staff, as I mentioned, is only about a thousand. Many of our partners who we who are vital to us have staff. They have way more than a thousand staff. Um, so you know, we I do like to stress, you know, don't get so laser focused if you think FAS is the right place that you close yourself off to some of those other opportunities. And of course, there are people who go back and forth between those partners. Um, just, you know, uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, one of the meetings I was having across campus, uh, one of the people I was meeting with is someone who used to work for FAS, who has since, uh, since left. 
So, um, you know, those are very important, uh, critical components even of the U.S. agricultural system. Um, so be aware of this. Um, we always like to point out, um, you know, the number of challenges that we try to address. You know, so this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, this is from uh, someone who's a sports ball player. Um, so, you know, everyone says the sky's the limit, but we've been on the moon. Um, this picture that you see on the left, this is a picture I took at uh, Cuttington University in Swakopa, Liberia. Uh, this is their agriculture uh, lab that they have. Uh, now, for those of you who have ever been or worked in a lab, you might notice something a little off about the picture there. Um, you know, you're, you're not seeing something. There is, there is no equipment there. The only thing you see are these tables. Now, these are very good tables, very solid. I mean, hardwood, you know, they can hold anything. There's nothing on there. Um, it's not a camera trick. There's no equipment hidden behind the camera, except for a single eyewash station, which is not hooked up. Um, so, you know, these are the sorts of challenges that we face in many of these places, you know, where we have, you know, a laboratory that has no laboratory. You know, so if we start saying, oh, it's very easy to do this, that, or the other, just take your PCR machine, ain't one. You know, so what can we do? How do we address these challenges in a way that's realistic? Right, you know, saying that in the ideal case we have a PCR machine is great, but there isn't a PCR machine, there's not going to be a PCR machine, so what can we do um, in those cases? Um, I'll also just note briefly uh, these cows on the right. This is from Northern Ghana. Um, anyone who here who works in cows, I promise these cows are fine, they are not starving. Please don't worry. Um, so, you know, as I like to uh, come back to the tomato metaphor that I've had throughout the presentation, you know, as they say, knowledge is understanding tomatoes are a fruit. Wisdom is understanding they don't belong in a fruit salad. But innovation, that's what we're looking for, is where you say, well, we turn tomatoes into salsa, which is basically a tomato-based fruit salad. So um, that concludes my formal remarks. Um, I actually don't know what time it is. Um, right on, right more or less on time. Um, so with that, I am happy to happy to take any questions, comments, thoughts, considerations as you watch the sunset off the Haitian coast. And for people who are online, I, I think I have the chat window up. So if you're online, you should be able to type things in the chat and they will show up on the screen over here. When will application starts to open up? for uh, internship experiences or other uh, opportunities? That's an excellent question um, because I know the, I have to know the answer. Um, so the, the jobs that FAS ourselves manage, um, and I'll explain what the distinction is in a second. Um, so the entry level positions that we manage, uh, we announce once per quarter. So about approximately every three months, plus or minus a few weeks. Um, it was apparently too hard to do it exactly every time. So um, there will be uh, every quarter we will announce two entry level uh, tracks, uh, one for economists and one for something else. Um, and so what we do is every three months we'll make that announcement and then we will see what positions are open and we'll start going down the list. Um, those lists do not roll over. So you know if we if we run out of that list and then the next three months comes up, there's a brand new list starting over. Um, like I said, those come out approximately once every three months. Um, my recommendation for those is there is a delightful computer system called USA Jobs. Um, it is not one of the best functioning computer systems you will ever encounter in your life. But you know, if you want to work for the government, you got to get used to computer systems that don't work very well. Um, but what you can set up on USA Jobs is you can set up a uh, email search. Uh, so in other words, you can have it. You can you can have it run the search for you on a periodic basis and then email you all the things that match your search criteria, which can include, for example, you can limit it to particular agencies, you can do particular uh, tracks, you can do particular keywords, you know, whatever combination of things you think is most useful. I will flag on that if you do set up a USA Jobs email search. Uh, number one, have it send you daily, not weekly. Um, some people think, oh, weekly is perfectly fine. The problem is, is a lot of entry level positions have a little asterisk that um, once they receive a certain number of applications, the position announcement will close. Um, and if you have a weekly search, by the time you even get the notification, it may have already reached that number. Um, 
The other thing I will note is do not use the keyword international um, in your USA jobs search um, parameters. The reason for that is that there is some generic text that we'll find in the, in the boring part of the job announcement that says, if you have an international degree, here's how you get it. So every single thing will get. Um, so that's not a useful word to search by. Um, uh, so those are the jobs that you, the FAS or sales manages. And you know, likewise, any other entry level jobs that we have, they're not part of that quarterly cycle will show up. Um, if you set your parameters to say, show me all the FAS jobs. Um, there are also internships, which you asked about. Um, and I see someone on the, on the internet has also asked about internships. Internships are a bit more uh, complicated. Um, so there are many internships that we don't, F we FAS do not manage. What I mean by that is they are managed at the USDA departmental level. Um, and then we are told that we have some interns, usually with very little warning. It'll be like the week before, I'm like, here's your intern. Like, we have an intern? Like, what, crap, what are they going to do? Um, we figure it out. It's, you know, it's good. I feel like the process could be a bit smoother. Um, so that's done through the departmental level. Um, I have to admit, I don't, I, as much as I've asked, I, no one will give me a clear answer as to how those programs are run, when they open up, when they close. Uh, you know, I sometimes feel like I'm a little kid, like, you know, mommy, where do the interns come from? It's like, tell you when you're older, um, still waiting. But, um, so that's the, now FAS does have two internship programs that we manage ourselves, um, kinda. Uh, we don't actually manage them ourselves. We actually outsource them. Um, but, you know, they're ours. They're only ours. No one else gets to use them. Uh, the most important of those is our international internship program, which, as the name would imply, um, takes interns and actually places them in our overseas offices. Um, usually over the summer, you know, things are somewhat negotiable. Um, the offices that we place people in, um, I would like to make it sound like there's some kind of grand strategic thought, it really comes down to who's got a desk uh, that we can put somebody at. Um, otherwise, we would actually do more of them. Um, if, you, if any of you have ever been inside a US embassy, they're, they're crunched for space. And so that's the major limiting factor there is we just have to have a physical place to sort of sit at. Um, so that is usually, I think, I think about eight to 10 placements a year in total, give or take. Um, if if someone bothers to tell me when that announcement comes out, I will be sending uh, that to Adrian, who can then send it out um, to the campus community. Um, there's a second uh, internship program that we do that we FAS manage, uh, which is much uh, even smaller still. Um, and that's uh, actually more of it best described as a sort of entry direct kind of internship entry combo program sort of deal. Um, I think that one is, yeah, I don't, I don't remember if that one is funded off the top of my head because um, that one's very expensive because that one basically comes with a master, basically pay for a master's degree and also you get a job. Um, so kind of competitive too, but uh, I don't remember if that one's funded right now. I just, because it's, it's apparently very expensive to get somebody a master's degree. Um, but, um, and of course, as with all things, you know, I always like to, I always have to stress, you know, Look at some of those partners that we work with also. You know, organizations like FAO, you know, the FAO of the United Nations has not only interns, but they have a very robust what's called a junior professional program, uh, which is almost like almost like a two-year internship. Um, you know, which is in at their office, generally at their headquarters in Rome, um, which has I will say the FAO headquarters has an excellent cafeteria, uh, unlike many government offices. Uh, if any of you have been at the FAO cafeteria, they just redone, redid it about a year ago, so it's much better now. Um, so, you know, those are definitely things to look at. Look at those partners, you know, UN agencies. One of the things that, you know, we find when people are applying for jobs with FAS is, you know, there are certain things which are, which are very helpful to have on an application. Having that international experience, you know, having is, is, is very, very uh, good. Because you know, there's a lot of people who come in with only theoretical experience, um, and you know, it's great to have the theory. It's great to have the background, um, but you know, it's something else. You know, when you get off a plane in a country and you're going through the airport and you're not even sure which door to go through to get out of the airport, um, let alone are you going to be able to negotiate a trade deal with this country? So, 
Does that answer? Does that? Well, yeah, that's question? fantastic. What would you mean? I'm just further asking mm -hmm. another question. What would you mean by like, international experience? Like you've gone across borders and been in different countries and whatnot. You'd be surprised how rare that is. Um, that's a good start. You know, work experience, international work experience is great. Um, you know, if you've had study abroad, so good speaking foreign languages. Um, a number of FAS staff uh, were previously in the Peace Corps. Um, you know, so those are things. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, probably if you said, well, you know, I took a Caribbean cruise and that went to other countries, that, that's probably not quite really international experience. But, you know, having been to countries, having, you know, especially if you live there, work there, um, that can be tremendously helpful to say, to, for us to have confidence when we're reviewing applications that, hey, this person knows what they're getting into. They've got that background. They've got that ability. They're not just doing something as they like the romantic idea of working international. Are the same type type of uh, jobs able to be for international persons that if they can go to go from Guatemala, I can go there and help in some of the research areas or something like that? So the, the jobs that are directly with USDA, by law, you have to be a US citizen. Um, dual citizenship's fine. Um, you know, might have some issues if your dual citizenship is with like, you know, Russia or Iran or something, but um, the dual citizenship is fine. Right? Actually, I have a coworker who's got, I think, four citizenships. Um, as long as one of them is American, <laughs> that's solid. Uh, but the uh, in for the jobs with a lot of our partners, that's not an issue. You know, so for example, if you're working work with uh, FAO, you know, you could be a citizen of any FAO member country, which it turns out is pretty much all of the countries. Um, that is if you're from Kosovo, but other than that, it's pretty much all of them. Um, so, you know, those those options do exist um, out there, and that's where we stress working with our partners. Um, I'll use as an example, as a specific example. Um, so there was an individual who um, we were working with for many years. He was actually working at um, Kansas State University. A uh, very smart guy. He was Eritrean. Not, you know, he didn't have U.S. citizenship. Uh, now, if you know anything about Eritrea, um, you know, it's the sort of place that people tend to leave and not go back to. Um, and so, but he wasn't a U.S. citizen. We couldn't hire him. Very smart guy. I mean, he can do all kinds of amazing calculations in his head. Um, well, anyway, he worked at Kansas State and he worked in some of our projects as a Kansas State employee. Uh, he later naturalized as a U.S. citizen and he now works for USDA um, out of our Kansas City office. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, those options exist if you wish to pursue them. Um, that's not to say that, you know, you must pursue them. But, you know, every, there's not one path that's right for everybody. Um, so, but that is, that is an example of a case where we had someone who was not a U.S. citizen who found a way to work with us, not necessarily for us, um, but then parlay that into ultimately working for us, you know, over the course. And his, that individual, by the way, is now the lead author of our annual food security report. So, you know, I think quite offers. You mentioned before um, that for some like job positions, you go to the United States of Job website. Uh, the internships would be the same process or would it be a different process? Uh, internships may or may not be on USA Jobs. Okay. Um, that again, that's that's part of part of my frustration. You know, when I try to get a clear answer about how we get interns, is that there is not a single source for those things. Um, I will say that the internships that FAS directly controls are not on USA jobs uh, because they are not legally considered federal jobs. Um, so we can't put them there. It, it's bureaucracy drives crazy. But um, so those you will not find. Out. And, and that can be to me the most frustrating thing because there's not a single place that you can go and, and see them. You have, to, you, know, you have to know where to find them, you have to hunt and pack it. And it's great if you know, and it's really frustrating if you know. And that's just, to me, that's federal service in a nutshell. So, you know, if you can overcome that, you know, you can deal with the rest of the nonsense. Where, where could we find like, uh, that, that? Like, would it be? Where would we possibly have uh, issue for that? Hith or fifth or in young. There's, there's no there's no clear answer in which. Um, we do have a careers page on the FAS website. It's 
this slash careers. Um, allegedly, all of our internship opportunities are put on that page when they are announced. Um, do I believe that's true? I do not. Um, that, but they they swear up and down that they do that. Um, if nothing else, that will that will have redirections to some of the places where they will be announced. Um, one of the things that I try to do, just on a, on a personal level, is when I find out about the announcement, because I don't even get notified sometimes when these announcements come out. Um, when I find out about them, I will send them to people like Adrian, who can then distribute them to people who are interested. Um, but again, the challenge is I'm sometimes not even told that they come out. Or, or worse, we used to have, I mentioned that international internship program. Uh, so it used to be, for whatever reason, they would always announce that the week between Christmas and New Year's. And it would be open for two weeks. And it's like, do you know every university is closed? Like people are on vacation. Why would you announce it then? Um, so, you know, not that this has been bugging me for the last 15 years, but. You mentioned that some of these like trade deals set up with the, uh, uh, through the USDA are, are like altruistic, right? Like much lesser developed countries. Like, good. Is there a program that is directed at that? I, I, that's something I have no idea to be in. Uh, altruistic is a strong word. Um, they might incidentally have positive benefits, um, but you know that's that's a happy coincidence, not necessarily the, the purpose. Um, but yeah, we have a number of programs with um, again we, legally we call them emerging markets, uh, but you know developing countries. Um, some of those are, you know, we try to employ the, employ the appropriate level of programming depending on the nature of the market. So, you know, a program that's appropriate for Japan is not going to be appropriate for Malawi, and a program that's appropriate for Malawi is not going to be appropriate for Japan. But we do have programs in Japan, and we do have programs in Malawi. Um, to use two examples. Um, but yeah, we, we have all kinds, we do a lot more uh, technical assistance in those developing countries, you know, trying to get, you know, because a lot of the countries will say things like, well, gee, we'd really like to have you know, better participation in international markets, but we don't know how to inspect and certify our products. We don't know how to test for pesticide residues. We don't know how to do these things. And so we'll provide technical assistance to them so they understand how to do these things, so they understand how to read a, you know, an MRL test report, so they understand, you know, these sorts of things. And then they can have confidence that what they're getting is legit, because that's what ultimately the challenge is, you know, it's not, it's obviously very patronizing if we were to say to some of these countries, like, oh, just trust us. You know, we don't, you know, we believe we're trustworthy, but we don't want to be like, oh, just trust us. No, no, no. We want them to actually understand. We want them to be there. We want them to do their own science and independently say, yeah, we've tested what the, what the U.S. said and we can vouch for it. Not just, well, the Americans know what they're doing. And we, you know, that's, we don't want, we don't want anyone to just assume that anyone knows what anyone is doing, you know. Uh, we want to see that, you know, that ability for them to replicate that, to do that on their own. You know, science, science 101, I guess, is the replication of the results. And sometimes, you know, in fairness, sometimes they don't replicate the results. Sometimes they find something that we did. So, and that can be for either because we missed something, because we made some kind of assumption, um, or in some cases it can be, well, you know, hey, in country X, there's some kind of environmental condition or some kind of thing that, that we didn't even check for. You know, there might be conditions that we don't have in the United States. You know, we have, we have occasionally we'll have, for example, you know, countries who will ask us for um, uh, assistance on testing for foot and mouth disease, you know, in cows. We don't have foot and mouth disease in the United States. We haven't had foot and mouth disease in the United States for decades. We don't test for it. Um, most even, you know, American veterinarians you know, who are, who are, you know, foot and mouth disease is a 10 minute mention in one lecture in vet school. You know, they've never seen it, they've never experienced it. You know, they might not even remember that it exists. Um, you know, but these are things that are very real issues in many other places. So, do y'all have any assistantships and fellowships with NC State for master's programs? That's like, Based in North Carolina, or so the the, the master's program uh, internships that we do are are can be anywhere in the United States. They're not they're not reserved for any particular geographic. So essentially, the way that the program works is it's incumbent upon the applicant to get a, get accepted to a master's program. Um, 
So we're not we're not going to get you into a particular one. You know, it's, you would have to be accepted into a master's program and then you know. Can you find that on that website up there? Uh, oh, if it if and when it's ever funded. Okay. I, again, it's my it's my recollection that hasn't been funded lately, but I I you know again they don't always tell me these things. So. I see no other question. Then, uh, with this information, is there an ad level where we can review and look over this information for possible like uh, positions that could be available? Like, is there a way we could review the slides? These slides? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Would there be a way we can like review the slides? Just, so, this is being recorded. Okay, so just watch the recording. Yeah, I'll post it on our Calgary National Programs website so you can go back and take that way. I mean, you can have a slide back to it. Right. Well, if there are no further questions, I won't keep people any longer. Um, if you do have questions that come up, my contact information can be found on the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, as I often say, uh, since basically no one ever emails me, you're always welcome to email me. Um, if I start getting a bunch, I might have to change that policy. But the time being, it's trouble time. Um, and, um, you know, I don't necessarily know the answer to every question. I will do my best to find out the answer to the question if I don't have it. Um, one of these days, I am going to figure out where the interns come from. Um, that's, that's, it's, it's been 15 years, so, you know, sooner or later, someone's going to tell me. But, um, you know, other than that. Okay. Thank you very much for your time.